Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to the EKG case for the week of June 16th, 2014. This case was sent from just across the border from Milton, Canada, by Dr. Mohamed Abrahim. Dr. Abrahim is an adjunct assistant clinical professor at a little-known university called McMaster's. Of course, I'm joking. Uh, McMaster's University up in Canada, very, very well-known university, and he's an emergency physician who happened to be working one day with the physician assistant Jan Greslow, and Dr. Abrahim wanted to make sure to give credit to Jan for uh, for making the pickup in this particular case. It's a subtle pickup, and it was a fantastic pickup that really made a difference, I think, with, with this particular patient. So they were working one day, and a 15-year-old girl presented to the emergency department after an episode of palpitations and near syncope. Now, by the time the patient had presented, symptoms were completely resolved. She, it sounds like she was doing pretty well. And she reported that she had had some prior episodes, had seen her family doctor, and the family doctor had simply told her that it was just anxiety. After all, she's an adolescent girl, and pretty much anything is just anxiety. You can blow it off, right? Well, maybe not so. Anyway, no EKGs had been done up until this point. And I guess I would pose a question, do you really need to do an EKG in a 15-year-old girl, especially somebody who presents in an asymptomatic state in a primary care physician's office or even to the emergency department? What exactly are you looking for? I think, you know, based on my experience, and many of you may attest to this as well, there certainly seems to be a little bit of a bias against getting EKGs on kids. And I don't know if that's because oftentimes people who primarily take care of kids are not as well trained in electrocardiography. They don't do EKGs as often. They're not as comfortable. I think maybe all of those are uh, perhaps the case. But anyway, an EKG was not obtained in the office, but this time it was obtained in the emergency department by Jan, and here is, uh, well, before we even get to the EKG, let, let's talk just very briefly about what exactly would be the reasons that you get an EKG in a young person who's having near syncope and palpitations. Remember, when we get EKGs, even though the majority of cases that we've reviewed on this video series focus on ischemia and maybe tachy and brady dysrhythmias, there are other things that you're always looking for on that EKG, especially when the presentation is syncope, near syncope, palpitations. If you're ever worried about a potential arrhythmia, you may not necessarily see the arrhythmia itself when the patient presents, but you may see some subtle indications that the patient has been having arrhythmias, and that's the reason that you need to get the EKG. So what else are you looking for besides just the active ongoing arrhythmia or ischemia maybe in an older patient. Well, the first thing you're always going to look at is the intervals. You want to make sure that you're looking for long QT syndrome, and there are a number of different causes of long QT. We're not going to go through that right now. We've done it in the past. And also, the other key interval that you're going to be looking for is the PR interval. It's oftentimes ignored, but if you don't look for PR intervals, you will miss WPW. WPW Key tip off there is the short PR, not the delta wave. And the reason I say that is, while it's true that WPW ought to have a delta wave, the delta wave is not always really obvious in all of the leads. So if you're in the habit of only looking for delta waves, you will miss WPW. Instead, get in the habit of always looking at the intervals, and you will never miss WPW because there is always a short PR everywhere there is a PR. The delta wave is not always that obvious in all of the leads, all right? What else? You're going to look for a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You're going to look for a brigada. And a fairly rare condition, arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, which we thus far have not looked at on the EKG video series, but we will soon because somebody was finally able to provide an arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia case. They are very rare, except in certain specific populations. We'll talk more about that another time. So that's a hint that in this case... We're not dealing with that, not this week, all right? So these are the things that you need to always be looking for when you get the 12 lead on a patient presenting with any of these complaints. Don't just focus on these top two. Okay, this slide's a mess, let's move forward. So here's the 12 lead EKG, and take a look at the 12 lead. It would be very, very easy to just look at this and say, well, you know, that's sinus rhythm, everything looks pretty good, and um, we're done. Well, 
One of the things that I learned from a true guru of electrocardiography, Dr. Edward Chung, who is one of the cardiologists that really got me inspired to learn more about electrocardiography back when I was in residency at Jefferson. One of the things that he always used to say is that when you look at the EKG, you need to look up, you need to look down, you need to look all around. In other words, don't just take a quick glance at the EKG, look in all of the leads. There's 12 leads up here. Look, they give you two rhythm strips. So essentially you've got 14 leads to look at. Look left, look right, look up, down. You know, he has to really focus on that because every now and then you're going to see the key diagnostic finding in only one place or in only one lead or in only one beat. And that's the key finding right here. Take a look at that beat. That just looks a little bit different, doesn't it? Well, let's take that lead two beat. We're just going to blow that up. And there's the normal beat, normal sinus rhythm. There's another, let me change the color there. There's a, a nice normal sinus rhythm beat right there, but there's something different about that beat, right? Well, what you notice is that there is a short PR, and that means you need to start thinking about WPW, and there's the delta wave up there, and slightly wide QRS. This patient has a WPW beat. This patient has intermittent WPW. Very interesting, and if you didn't look carefully and find that that difference in the one beat right there, you would miss WPW in this particular patient. So let's briefly talk about Wolf Parkinson White. Uh, this is one of my favorite things to talk about, and so we're going to talk about it again. We've talked about it before. We'll talk about it again in the coming weeks because some pe other people have also sent me some really great cases. So this is not rare. Up to 3% of the population may have WPW. It often goes unrecognized, and if you simply look at arrhythmia ED populations, it may be even more common <clears throat> than that. For the boards, remember the classic triad. This is a great boards question. Short PR, slightly widened QRS. It doesn't have to be massively widened, but slightly widened. And of course, the characteristic delta wave. And everybody always looks at the delta wave. But again, what I want to emphasize is get in the habit of always looking at the PRs. You'll notice that there's a short PR. And if you always look at intervals in your EKGs, you will never miss WPW. So this is normal conduction. This is the way, assuming you don't have WPW, the listeners out there. Uh, well, some, statistically, 3% of the listeners out there have WPW. I don't want to scare you. But um, anyway, uh, this is what the other 97% of us, and I say us hopefully in a hopeful way because I've never actually gotten an EKG in myself, but uh, this is what normal conduction is. You've got your sinoatrial node, which sends an impulse down through the atrium, and as it goes through the atrium, the atrium contracts, and that produces your P wave, okay? No big surprises here. Then the impulse goes through the AV node, which is not just a dot, but it's kind of like a big smudge within the heart, and as the impulse goes through that area, through the AV node, nothing is happening. There's nothing that happens as the impulse goes through the AV node, and as a result, you get a flat line. That is the impulse traveling through the AV node. Then, after it goes through the AV node, that impulse fires very, very rapidly through this very efficient, very rapid conduction system called the hiss Purkinje system, and you get almost virtual simultaneous contraction of the entire ventricle, and that produces a narrow QRS complex. So that's what's normally happening with normal conduction. When a person has WPW, or any type of pre-excitation, there is an accessory pathway. And, and notice that the accessory pathway has no AV node to slow things down. There's no smudge there. The impulse actually just fi flies right on through and hits the ventricle early, thus the term pre-excitation. So what happens is the impulse comes down here and it hits the ventricle early and you start getting myocyte to myocyte conduction which is very inefficient. And then that impulse slowly starts spreading through the ventricle, and that's why you get this slurred upstroke of the QRS complex, a very inefficient contraction. It's a slurring of the upstroke. There's no PR, or, or rather, there's no AV node that slows things down. The impulse that's coming down this way is slowed, and then eventually it goes through the Hisper-Kinji system and catches up,
And that's why the initial part is slurred because of that myocyte to myocyte connection. But then this impulse ends up making it through. And so the rest of the QRS is very narrow and very efficient looking. It's only that initial upslope which was reflective of your myocyte to myocyte conduction out there. But because you get early ventricular excite or conduction out here, you, you lose your PR interval or it becomes very short. And that's the reason why you have a short PR because the ventricle started beating early out here before it caught up out there. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense about why you have a short PR, the slurred upstroke, and also the resulting slightly widened QRS complex. Now, WPW patients are predisposed to developing atrial tachydysrhythmias. I don't know if they're predisposed to ventricular tachydysrhythmias. I don't think so. I've never seen that reported or in the literature. It may be true. I just haven't seen it before. But definitely, they're predisposed to atrial tachydysrhythmias. AFib, for sure. A flutter, maybe. SVT, for sure. SVT is the most common atrial tachydysrhythmia these patients get. But AFib is the killer that we worry about. And we'll talk more about that in upcoming uh, video casts. We've talked about that in the future. Okay. Uh, so there's two types of SVTs. There's orthodromic and antidromic, and we'll briefly talk about that. W here is AFib with WPW. The reason why this is a killer is because with atrial fibrillation, fibrillation means the atrium is beating four, five, six hundred times per minute. And when those impulses head down the accessory pathway, there's nothing to slow them down. So the result is that these patients can have enormously rapid, incredibly rapid, ventricular rates, and some of the impulses will be narrow, some will be wide, and you get fusions between the two. So the resulting rhythm is irregularly irregular with morphologies that are changing in appearance. And also, in some places, you can get rates of 250, 300 beats per minute. And people don't tend to tolerate those rates quickly. People can die. And also, some of the therapies can kill these patients that we'll talk about in, in the future. What is more common is SVT. There's two types of SVT. There's orthodromic and antidromic. Again, we'll put a link on the website that shows you <clears throat> where we've talked about this in the past for more detail. Orthodromic simply means that the impulse is heading down the normal Hisperkinji system and then up the accessory pathway as a reentrant limb, down the normal pathway, up the accessory pathway as a reentrant limb, and it spirals around very, 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 very rapidly in a circuit type of movement. And because it's hitting the ventricle through the normal conduction system, the QRS complexes are narrow. It's narrow regular tachycardia. It looks just like any other SVT that you've ever seen before. Okay, With antidromic tachycardia, the impulse goes down the accessory pathway, thus wide QRS complex, and it goes up the normal pathway as its reentrant limb. Down the accessory pathway, up the Hisperkinji. Down the accessory pathway, up the normal pathway, spiraling very, very rapidly in an electrical circuit. And as a result, you get a wide regular complex, uh, wide regular rhythm, and it looks just like VTAC. All right, and we'll talk about why SVTs can be treated pretty easily. No big deal, but these are the two types of SVTs that patients get. All right, so back to the pa uh, patient's case. Patient was admitted uh, to the hospital uh, in uh, Toronto, seen by a pediatric cardiologist who confirmed that the patient has WPW. Thank you very much. And that night, the patient had a recurrent episode. They got a 12 lead EKG, and what do you think they saw? Well, they saw the most common type of tachydysrhythmia that these patients get, a narrow, regular tachycardia. This is the orthodromic SVT that we just talked about a second ago. And how do you treat these patients? Very simple. If you remember that this is simply an electrical circuit, all right, Anytime you cut a circuit, you give an AV nodal blocker, for example, you give them adenosine, it breaks the circuit and converts them back to sinus rhythm. So because it's an electrical, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Because it's an electrical circuit, just like your days in physics, you remember that? If you didn't block physics out of your mind, which most of us probably did, if anytime you have a circuit, if you cut the circuit anywhere along the course of the circuit, you will break them and convert them. And uh, that's exactly what adenosine does. Adenosine is a potent AV nodal blocker, and it converts these patients right back to sinus rhythm. And um, so, again, take a look at this. 
patients back in sinus rhythm, there's no evidence of WPW on this EKG. It was just that simple one complex on the other EKG that Jan was able to pick up. And that had it not been for that good fortune where a WPW beat happened to show up during the 12 lead EKG, it's very possible that they would have never found out, at least not this early, they would have never found out that this patient has the, uh, the WPW, all right? Uh, so it was good luck that that beat was there and also good luck that they were able to, to, to notice it and not um, miss it. So quick take home points about uh, syncope, near syncope palpitations in general. Remember, why is it that you get the 12 lead EKG? What are you looking for on the 12 lead EKG when somebody presents with syncope, near syncope palpitations? Well, everybody always remembers to look for ischemia. Tackies, Brady's, AV blocks, those are pretty easy to pick up. They're obvious. But even patients that are asymptomatic need the EKGs. What are you looking for in those asymptomatic patients on the EKG? You need to scrutinize the intervals, looking for a long QT and short PR, which tips you off to WPW. You need to look for a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We've talked about that before. Remember, it's high voltage with deep, narrow cues. We'll talk about that at some point in the, in the future again. You look for a Brigada syndrome in V1, V2. You're, you're, you're going to see the incomplete or complete right bundle pattern with uh, the T-wave inversion, V1, V2. Again, we've talked about that in the past. And I've got a whole bunch of cases that I've been procrastinating on, but we're going to do Brigada syndrome in some detail in the coming weeks. And then, of course, arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, which is not common, but we're going to talk about it in the coming weeks as well. And again, remember, don't hesitate to get EKGs on young patients. For those of you that are that are primarily take care of pediatric patients, do not fear the EKG. Get the EKG. Or if you don't like EKGs, get the ECG. You're going to pick up some life-saving diagnoses here with even some basic skills. Do not hesitate to get the 12 lead ECG. Remember, it's just a piece of paper and ink, for gosh sakes. Don't, don't fear it. WPW can be intermittent. It's not always there. And remember, look up, look down, look all around, look everywhere on that 12 lead EKG because sometimes your key diagnosis is only made in one lead or in one portion of the EKG or sometimes, like in this case, in only one complex do you get the diagnosis. So look everywhere on that 12 lead EKG. Well, I hope that case was helpful. And uh, my thanks to Dr. Abrahim and Jan for, for sitting in that case. And uh, folks, I look forward to talking to all of you next week. Until then, take care.